only several people know about what happened with Blueberry. I've never told all of the confusing bits and pieces strung together properly. And it took me two weeks to compile this. I'm going to start by sharing memories and details that I had filed away extra well. And they've all started flooding back. Sophomore year in high school is when all of this started. That would be 2003. His real name was Michael D, but he was called Blueberry by our circle of friends. I have long forgotten the story behind the moniker, but I imagine that it was selected mostly to distinguish from the many other Michaels around. He was tall, gawky, acne afflicted, and a junior who had a hands in pockets angry walk a deep dimple in the middle of his chin, and an absolutely unintelligible manner of speaking. Unintelligible, to the point where his secondary nickname was Michael Mumble. I don't remember anything particular about that meeting. Really, just a few passing words, and a mutual friend stepping in to wave an introductory hand back and forth while repeating our names to one another in quick bursts, like a squeeze on a rifle. I was a spunky 15 year old, discovering a whole new diverse world out there. And in retrospect, I see how my giddy naivete left a door wide open for Blueberry to step through. He would talk, well, mumble, to me before first period. I struggled to understand what he said behind his tight lips that hardly ever moved. So our interactions were usually brief and consisted mostly of me smiling brightly and nodding along before politely excusing myself. I often picked up on his awkward anger and aggression, stuffed so deep into his snug six foot frame. All teenagers are angry. Hell, even spunky me had my moody sprees. But Blueberry's anger was different. It was a warped, twisted, stubborn, narcissistic, permeating, calm, autistic kind of anger. I remember thinking to myself that it just burnt the air around him. So being 15, I had no calm. So I took my lunches at a subway that sat two blocks away from the school. Sometimes I went with friends, but more often I went by myself. I liked the quiet and the chance to regroup from school's chaos. He appeared one day, mumbling away across from me in a booth while I pasted on a slightly puzzled smile, lips tight over my mouthful of food, wondering what on earth he was saying. And then the letters came. My best friend, Christy and I, wrote tomes of notes during our class periods to fold up into neat squares and swap with each other in the halls. This is how we plotted and schemed before the advent of text messaging. We had designated hallways where we would hand off our paper squares. And one of these hallways was where I would also see Blueberry. One day, I just had slyly palmed Christie's note into my hand when I suddenly felt a tap on my shoulder and paper slid into my other hand. It was Blueberry, staring fixedly at me with a slight smile, with a surprised chuckle and a nod of acknowledgement. I tucked Blueberry's note into my purse along with Christie's. I soon found out, not only was he Michael Mumble, he was also Michael Muddled. 
while his handwriting was neat and printed, and I was far from illiterate. I could not make heads or tails of his train of thought. He wrote as he spoke, in a mashed, inverted manner, wherein the subject matter was vague at best. All I could make out of the letters he gave me, from that day on, was that I was part of the subject matter. Something about my considerations, or me not seeing, filling up the paper margins, were badly drawn frogs, babbling about druids and more frogs. I got these letters often, usually daily. I probably wrote a short note on the back to him once, maybe twice at most. But they came steadily as ever. As spring wound down, I began to get more and more uneasy around him. To the group, Blueberry was just Blueberry. A slight oddball in any case, who was usually in the background. And I began to avoid him. But he seemed blind to that. In retrospect, at the age of 25, I can safely say that people pick up on when you are avoiding them. But not Blueberry. The lunchtime interceptions and notes continued when he could manage it. And then came the gifts. I was a writer back then. I always had notebooks that I constantly filled up with any scribblings that came into my head. I wrote in the cheap, smaller sized spirals that you can pick up at any drugstore. I knew better than to buy nice fancy ones. They'd last me a week at best. But it was a fancy heavy bound journal that Blueberry gave me one day in the hallway after school. I didn't know what to say. It was an odd gift from someone who I barely knew. There was something tainted about the journal. It was beautiful. A plush notebook etched with the design of an ancient map of China. And I swear the covers were of suede. It was expensive, enchanting, and it gave me the chills. The first ten pages consisted of yet another letter he had penned to me. The first several paragraphs talked of how I was the only one who understood him, and that he loved me. I stopped at that point. I could never bring myself to write in or throw it away. Instead, I tucked it in a keepsake box that slept underneath my bed, along with all the other notes and trinkets. I told myself I was giving off the wrong signals. I told myself I was being silly and overreacting to someone who was perfectly nice. Christy told me, you're lucky that someone buys you something so nice without even trying to sleep with you. Friends told me, Ah, Blueberry's just a goof, but he's all right. I was grateful when the summer rolled around. And then came junior year. When school started back up, I had a boyfriend named Adam. Brightly dyed red hair and a red car. So Blueberry inevitably faded into the background, whether he liked it or not. He had no driver's license, nor a wish to get one, strange for being 18, as he was then. He opted for the alternative of a bicycle, and walked everywhere. Looking back, I realised that this made it harder for him to intercept me at lunch, when I zipped off to meet my older boyfriend at home for the hour-long break. The only times I would see Blueberry was when I was pulling out of the parking lot, and I would see him doing his brisk, frustration fueled strides in whatever direction. His eyes were always either angrily fixed at a point in the distance, and his chin in a slight line of frustration, or seemed to be searching the sea of high school students, flooding the parking lot for who I think was me. Every now and then, 
he would spy my cherry red Volvo station wagon, which was embarrassingly hard to miss, and he would stare. For the most part, humans can get a decent read on others. This wasn't the case with Blueberry. I could make neither heads or tails of him and his behaviour around me. And eventually, my teenaged hormones finally said, screw it. By which I mean, I made no more efforts. I decided that the best way to fix the situation was to not give a shit. If he talked to me, I would respond with short sentences, then bluntly turn and walk away. I didn't avoid him, neither did I approach him or wave at him in the hallways like I had the year before. He was just another guy in the background. Let me add that in the meantime, the letters never stopped, and the gifts came almost like clockwork. A journal left on my car, with the first four pages scribbled with words that I never bothered to read. A bouquet of daisies or roses given to me in the hallway that I promptly gave to a lonely looking freshman as I turned the next corner. A book of fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen to be exact on my birthday, also with an inscription inside. The journals, books and letters were hardly ever actually read, nor used, and all found a new home in that keepsake box underneath my bed. I could never explain why I felt compelled to tuck them into the keepsake box, but I just did. At times I would feel guilty, and I would look for anything that I was doing to lead to this insane boy what on earth compelled him in order to buy things for a girl that just didn't care? But in the end, my teenage psych always lost interest and went back to scheming over how I was going to work around curfew and catch that wicked show happening at the local music venue on a school night. My junior year of high school wound down much like this. When school let out for summer, I was just happy to be able to be with friends and not worry about Blueberry, as he was a senior and had been in his last year of school with us. I came home one afternoon and sauntered into the kitchen to grab a snack. My father had come home from work, barely beating me by five minutes. As I could tell, by how he had already taken off his jacket and suitcase, and had brought in the mail. This was part of his workday routine. I could time the man by his routines practically, and he was leaning against the kitchen counter and plucking the bills from my mother's overflow of catalogues. When I came up to peck him on the cheek, an offer one of the two apples I had retrieved. Hey there, Han, he mumbled, taking the apple. Whoa, hold up, kid. You have mail. Lucky you. He flipped a rectangular manila envelope towards me, and I took it. Who's sending me snail mail? I think to myself, popping open the sealed flap. Maybe it's grandma. Oh, does it feel like a check in here? I start to hum a Smith song as I pry open the brands that anchors the flaps. Girlfriend, in comma. Oh no, I really didn't want to see her. Pull the letter out, and it's a single page of lined notebook paper. Shake the page. Girlfriend, in coma. My eyes focus on the first line. I really didn't want to. Shit. I knew that handwriting. Blueberry. I remember yelping in surprise and dropping the letter, as it had burnt me. I remember grabbing the envelope and flipping it over to see where the addresses should be. And I don't know why. I already knew it wouldn't make me feel better to see the street numbers I called home 
along with my name carefully printed in the centre. It didn't make me feel better, however, to see that a city in Colorado was listed in the top left return address. Blueberry had left Texas, or so I hoped, because it sure made me sick to see that there was no postage stamp. He had to have hand-delivered it to my home, which he had somehow tracked down. The letter frightened me, in both its content as well as the fact that Blueberry had found out where I lived. I grilled all of our mutual friends, and all swore that they hadn't been the ones to give out the information. In the letter itself, he had sounded almost angry with me, or upset, that I hadn't made good on several sorts of agreements. Thankfully, that was the last I heard of Blueberry. Well, for a few years anyway. Those events took place in 2005. Fast forward to spring 2008, where I was living in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but preparing to move back to my hometown to kick a nasty drug habit and get a fresh start on life. I had taken a break from packing up my apartment and headed to the library to clear my head and check my MySpace. All hail 2008. There was a friend request waiting for me. Yup. The cliche reappearance that the protagonist soon ruse. It was Blueberry. Still to this day, I have no idea what possessed to accept the request. But I did. God damn it, I accepted. And immediately I got a message from him. It was quite civilised, actually. He asked how I was doing, and even offered an apology for his behaviour in high school. I was pleasantly surprised, and appreciated the gesture, and sent him a response saying so, along with a brief synopsis of my plans on moving back home, only after ensuring that he was still in Colorado, as his profile said. By the time I clicked send, my allotted time on the computer was up, so I logged out and headed back to my place to prepare for the move home the next day. Three days and one state later, I was back at home and finally feeling human, as the bumps and bruises of the move subsided. It had been a very busy few days, and I gladly plopped down in front of my father's laptop to check my emails and social media. I logged into my MySpace and began to work through the stacks of accumulated messages. I opened the reply from Blueberry. It had been sent almost instantly after I had sent mine several days ago. Well, that's a coincidence. Blueberry was moving back to our hometown as well. Godspeed to him in all endeavours, was all I thought of it. I didn't think I would be running into him often, as our old group of friends had long since disbanded to get married, move away, or to get locked up. I had just picked up a job waiting tables at the 24-7 diner chain, Denny's, and enrolled in a summer college course. Life went on, but not for that long. I had just started the swing shift at work, and I was at the counter, filling up salt and pepper shakers, and setting up on the floor before the dinner rush hit, when he walked in. I knew who he was, while he was still in my peripheral. He slid into the swivel chair and mumbled what I can only imagine was a hello. Then, he put his right hand on mine, which was wrapped around a salt tumbler that I had been refilling. Terror and confusion paint my insides. Another spike in blood pressure as he squeezes down hard, if only for a second, before releasing his grip, and he starts to mumble. I should have told him to piss off that day. I should have listened to my gut, 
which was screaming profanities at my rationalising everything away brain. I knew that he moved from Colorado back down to our hometown because I was there. I knew that he had taken my reply on MySpace as a sign of declaring my undying love to him in his twisted mind. I knew deep down that he was the same scary dick that found out where I lived in high school. But a part of me had truly thought that he had matured past the point and that all was wishful thinking. Instead, I smiled politely, nodded, and excused myself to do anything but be around him. I ended up going to the bathroom and dry heaving. Anxiety. It's a bitch. I was stuck. I was the only waitress on the floor until seven, which was a good three hours away. And I had a credit card payment due in three days. I couldn't leave the floor. I remember talking to myself like a crazy person. He had only said one word. I was being ridiculous. Nobody is twisted enough to do that over a girl that's barely spoken to him or returned any affections. Ludicrous. And who knew what he actually said back there, or what he meant by touching my hand. He could just be surprised to see me. So who's the crazy person here? Me. Then, why did he look at me as if he were gloating? As if he was hungry? Dry heave to the porcelain gods again, and then I dart off to the floor. I stay busy, staying away from the counter and staying away from Blueberry. Unbeknownst to me, while I went about avoiding him, Blueberry applied for a position as a dishwasher, which is always open in diners, and was hired on the spot. I found out the next day as I clocked in and saw him carefully studying the employee schedule. I should have said something then, but I didn't. I was afraid. I didn't have time to think either. I managed to somehow change clothes, tie my apron, dry heave yet again from anxiety several times before my shaking legs found their way onto the floor. Like I said before, so much of it is a blur. I don't remember specific incidences happening up towards the end. I remember Friday night bar rush when he yelled at a 65 year old man, a regular of mine. And the reason he yelled was because he thought he was looking at me with perverted eyes. I remember how many times he tried to stop me while I was neck deep in the weeds with drunk and hungry customers, catching my arm rougher each time and make me stop and look at him. The last time he grabbed me so hard a bruise bloomed in place of his fingers next morning. I remember the look of pure hatred and frustration that he gave every one of my male customers, and I remember how he said he would slit them from ear to ear if they ever touched me. I remember when my shift ended, and I held all of it in until I made it into the walk-in freezer. I had just let out a half sob, when the freezer door had swung open and Blueberry had made himself in front of me. I remember the metallic taste of fear as I looked up at him. What next? He was looking forward to the talk we would have after work, he said. Oh, the talk about us. Oh, God, no. I remember wanting to scrub my forehead with lye from where he bent down and kissed me before exiting the walk-in. He made me sick being so close to me. Dirty. I remember the desperate need to leave. I clocked out, knowing that he wouldn't be off work for hours until after I was. I could escape. I pulled out of the parking lot and stopped at a red light two blocks down. Find a friend to stay with. Figure all of this out. God, I need my job. Then the passenger door opens. Shit! It's him! 
When the hell did my passenger door not lock? Shit. Did he? He broke my lock. Shit. He's in my car. And I am numb. He acts like this is a normal thing for us to do. And my logic freezes. He gives me directions to his house. Telling me how happy he is that I came around after all these years of denying that what was between us was real. I couldn't breathe. A part of me is giving up. A part of me is so angry at myself for being so weak and unable to stop all of this. Wait, I'm not completely numb. There is some anger left in me. I'm starting to get angry at this person who has repeatedly refused to take no for an answer, who intentionally came back to our town with the narcissistic, presumptuous intent of claiming me, now that I had supposedly come around. He came into my job and made sure to move fast, hard and aggressively, because he knew this was what I would do. The only words I had ever heard him speak clearly and without a single mumble was a threat to slip my customer's throat from ear to ear. He walked out of his first night of the job just to follow me and got into my car as I was at a spotlight. Screw that. As I had the opportunity to sit and process the absurdity and increasingly disturbing levels of the situation, I became temporarily lost in a fugue state of memory realization and gritty resolve. We reached his place and I snapped back to reality. Immediately, I saw that the front lawn was teeming with drunken partygoers. His roommate had thrown a keg party that drew enough people to fit a high school stadium. To this day, I consider this the only reason I felt brave enough to do what I did next. There were too many people around to see and hear things. I knew it, and he knew it, and he didn't seem happy with it. His face is one that still haunts my nightmares. That was rage, like a child having his toys taken away from him. That's exactly what I was to him, I later realised. I followed him into the house. I let him take me to his room. I stood in the open doorway and balked as he tugged on my wrist to pull me into the room for God knows what reason. And it was like another person was speaking through me. Stay the hell away from me. I never have and will never be interested in you as a friend or anything else. You know what the hell you have been trying to do. And you've been trying to do it since I was 15. Don't come near me again. You need professional help, you son of a bitch. Then I realised how quiet it was. I swear to God everyone in the party stopped and stared at us. It was so quiet. And all the blood in my body was pumping in a war dance of fear disguised as rage. I saw him falter. And we locked eyes. I could tell he was grasping, and then I tried to pull away, but he was strong. Shit. Then he screamed. God, I'll never forget how angry he looked. He wasn't mumbling. He screamed so clearly. Just lay with me tonight. Why won't you just lay down on the bed, you- He lurched forward, like a tension-bearing spring to drag me into the room. It was at that point that the bodies flew at him. Several of them. They tackled Blueberry to the floor. Beer was flying everywhere. The froth was landing in my hair and my shirt was wet with the faint scent of fresh hops. There was screaming. Hands on hands. Girl hands. Nail was digging into Blueberry's iron fingers. I could feel my blood slowing at the pockets where he had me firmly. My arms must be blue, I thought to myself. And I saw the girls, three of them, blonde and red, 
They all yell to run and to get away from him. His fingers are slipping claws. But the long, solar nails of the three women are too much, and he flinches with a jerk that forces him to let go. He disappears under the heap of bodies, and my legs worked again. I ran to my car, and ran the hell away. I still don't know who the men who tackled him were. Neither do I know the names of the women who scratched their own nails into Blueberry's skin, so that he would let go, and they could flank me in protection as I ran to my car. Still, to this day, I don't think I've ever been faced with a truer definition of solidarity than that act right there. They didn't even know who I was when they all dove in. I don't know what kind of spiritual forces out there roaming the purple evenings with those who were alone, but more nights than not, I say a little thank you to the skies, hoping at least one of them hears me. I owe those strangers a great deal. Now that I've said that, the thing of this part of the story is, it's not over. It hasn't gotten bad yet, not by a long stretch. At this point, I wish I could say that it was all over, but it wasn't. Stalkers are persistent. They don't think like you and I do. What I had done the night I told Blueberry no was something good and bad. Good in that I had acted loudly enough to become a person to him, not an object. Bad in the sense that I had set down boundaries that conflicted with his intents. And I had done it at a crowd of people, profoundly embarrassing him. I knew that where he had just seen me as a living doll before, he would now see me as someone to be punished. This is what I thought to myself as I stared at the ceiling, stained with the sharp gold light of noon sun. I had barely slept after crashing through my front door, and quickly, desperately, checking each window and door's lock in my father's house before collapsing into a heap by the bed. My father wasn't home, as he usually stayed over at his new girlfriend's place. I didn't mind. It was nice to see him in love. It took the years off his face, and I didn't want to put those years back on with my predicament. I didn't want to see the look in his eyes if he saw bunches of broken blood vessels blossom that ran up my arms in dull spirals of pain. Didn't want to see him and Blueberry in the same room either. No, I didn't want him to feel disappointed or upset in me. I had kicked the habit and worked diligently on my decision-making skills, but my helplessness in dealing with Blueberry seemed to me a return to life that I thought I had left behind. No, it was better to figure this out myself. He had spent enough sleepless nights worrying about me. I was suddenly thankful for my parents' recent divorce. My mother stayed behind in the house I grew up in, and my father had rented out a lovely house in an adjacent neighbourhood. Blueberry couldn't possibly find me here. With that comforting thought, I pulled myself out of bed and dressed. I remember picking a shirt with sleeves that covered the bruises he had left. I didn't even care that it was easily a hundred degrees outside. Anything to keep from seeing and remembering his brand on me. I padded towards the kitchen, stopping at the large glass window panes. I padded towards the kitchen stopping at the large glass window panes that faced the open schoolyard across the street. Pulling back the blinds, I took in the grassy, sun-drenched view. I liked the house. It was open. I could see anybody coming. But it was quiet for now. In the kitchen, I stepped into the cupboard and plucked a fresh bag of chips. I was starving. I had just started to pull open the bag of chips, when the banging started. They were a parody of polite knocks. 
I had no idea how he found me. Still, to this day, I don't know. But it doesn't matter how. Just that he did. But I knew who was behind the door. Just as that person knew that I was hiding in there somewhere. At the very first echo of Blueberry's fist hitting the front door, my legs turned to dust beneath me. The bag of chips burst as I collided with the linoleum. My body's momentum transforms the potato shards into millions of traitors echoing every move. I was sobbing silently, hiding behind the fridge and watching the shadow slide along the floor where I had been just seconds ago, gazing out the window with that false sense of safety. And then he knocked again, and then there was silence. My phone buzzed on the counter. I stretched my arm upwards and clutched that little electronic beacon of freedom. A text from 303 area code, Colorado, him. The text illuminates the screen. My dear, I know you're there. Let me in. I have your favorite Subway sandwich for you. And a surprise. Jesus, how did he get my number? My sleeve has been pushed back from the reach of the phone. I see the bruises again, a friendly reminder from Blueberry. Some of them are the same shade as his name. The knocks have been quiet, and there are no more shadows on the wooden floor by the window. I remember that there was a click in my brain at that moment. Something finally connected. My survival instincts are finally triggered, as I shift from frozen to overdrive. I am no longer a human. I am a gazelle running from a lion. Chips crunch under my shoes as I snap up to my feet, keys and phone in hand, and run for the sake of everything I love in the world. I hear metal creak behind me in the kitchen, just as I slam open the front door, and all the sunlight outside charges every cell in my bruised body, and from the front steps, I dive into the car, through the open passenger side window. I leave the perfect arc of rubber marks on the driveway, as I reverse, swivel my head, and scan the yard for him. There is nowhere to hide in this wide open neighbourhood. Nothing. He is unseen. The gas pedal is one with the floorboards. I am thankful that the students of the elementary school across the street are not out for recess, because I would braid them into the sticky tarmac without a second thought if they had stood between me and my safety. That is my level of fear. I keep driving, blowing through all yields and stops. I wonder if I'm crazy, and my phone buzzes with another text from Colorado. No, not crazy, scared. Not of death. Not yet, anyway. Scared of what he will do to make me return to his normalcy. I am a doll to him. What happens when the doll starts to speak? When they run like a gazelle away from his playroom rules? What happens if the lion catches the gazelle? I dry heave and sob at once. Oh God, the fear. I feel like he's with me right now. Watching. It does occur to me to call the police, but what do I tell them? They would look like I was crazy, just like everyone else had reassured me that Blueberry was fine, just odd. So very odd. Maybe. I still am crazy. I am 55 and a 25 year old after all. But I know that I can't be alone at this moment. I pick up my phone and dial for Brandon. He lives the closest, and have to read our twice. Blueberry keeps texting, and the alert makes me exit my keypad. His messages tell me about the lack of appreciation for the things he does. I dry heave. I'm still going. Finally, 
I'm able to input all seven digits. Hello? Brandon's voice is an angelic sound. I cry. All that comes out is the name of the street I'm on. He directs me to a park a block away from where I am, and I see him. He sees me. I leave the keys in the ignition but turn off the car, and I run across the green field to him. I feel like I can't do anything but run for dear life. Brandon catches me, holds me tight in the arms with two big hands. My bruises hurt under his palms, and my lungs are on fire. I can't stop my legs from twitching. I babble. I'm not crazy. I'm not crazy. He found me. Please don't tell him where I am, Brandon. Please. And I collapse on the soft grass. Brandon tells me later that he pieced the story together from what he could hear me say, curled up in the fetal position on the grass, babbling about blueberries, bruising, and being an object. He wasn't sure what to make of it, and admits that he thought I was back on the shit and was just having a bad come down. Then he goes to retrieve the keys from my car and the ignition. My phone is on the front seat, still lighting up incessantly with messages from a 303 number. Brandon sees this. He opens my phone and reads several of the 52 messages sent in the last half hour. That's almost one every 40 seconds. He says he couldn't bear to read any more after seeing the one that included a photo of my open underwear drawer. It dawned on Brandon that Blueberry is inside my home and enjoys letting me know. Brandon hugs me and talks with me until Carly and Kate get to the park. Carly and Kate will take me to their house where we will call the police. Brandon has warrants, so he can't be with there with us. But before he leaves, he hugs me so fiercely that it reminds me that I am real, not plastic. He whispers into Carly's ear and advises her to check the messages on my phone if she doesn't believe. She makes it to the message where he tells me he will shave my red harlot's hair off if I didn't come back and be good. My phone rings and Carly answers. It's my father. Kate drives my car home. They stay as I hear what has happened. The next door neighbor had been in her kitchen when he saw me run out the door and peel out of the driveway. The clue, she said, was how I had thrown myself in the car through the window as if I couldn't waste a minute opening the door. She went closer to her window to watch the scene as my car faded away. She looked at the front door of the house and she saw a tall, thin man coming out of the front door and staring in the direction I had gone. She said he looked angry and I looked terrified. She called the police. My father, unaware of this, came home soon after the neighbours called the police. Blueberry was back outside on the porch by then, perched on his step, watching and waiting. My father stared at the strange boy on his steps. He saw the tire tracks and the absence of my car. Blueberry calmly looked up at my father, met his gaze, and blankly said that he was thinking about getting her a vanity for her birthday. My father tells me that Blueberry stood up and placed himself between my dad and the door. My father was a criminal defense attorney for 30 years. He is a stoic, tough man who has defended countless rapists, killers, thieves and addicts, and the truly innocent before a jury of peers. Not much shakes him. Yet the tremor in my father's voice is perceptible as he tells me this. He stares Blueberry down and simply says, Do you pay for this house, boy? I don't answer to you. Get out of my way. Blueberry moves, and my father goes inside, disturbed by the boy on the stairs and glad that I'm not there. In the kitchen, he sees the crushed bag of chips on the floor, the mess in the kitchen, 
and he could see the signs of frantic movement etched into the carpet of chips. He can see that the back door is wide open, and that I would never leave it like that. He also remembers that the front door had been unlocked. He and I shared a paranoia of unlocked doors, and it was then that my father knew something was very wrong. He feels sick. He sprints to the front door. Hey kid! He roars at Blueberry, retreating back. He had taken off down the street when he heard the sirens. The police cars called by the neighbours pull up at this point. One patrol goes in pursuit of Blueberry, and the others stay talking to my father, who is calling my phone, and our astute neighbour, who relates what she had seen through the window. The police ask if I knew who this man was on the stairs, and Carly gives them my phone as an answer. My father sees one of the pictures over the cop's shoulder, turns pale, and closes his eyes. I see the years go back on his face. I can't stop crying. I can't get a word out. All I can do is lead them all to my bedroom, where Carly holds up the bed skirt as I reach underneath and pull out the three keepsake boxes that I had filled with the last five years worth of Blueberry's gifts and mostly unopened letters. Carly brings me a yearbook and I cry harder and harder as I open up the page with his class photo on it and point at his full name. I am crying this hard because it's over. I'm crying this hard because it could have been over long ago before this point. The officer bags up all the contents of the boxes and flashes of cameras capture any traces of what had happened that afternoon. I give a short statement once I can speak coherently. They don't find Blueberry, but my father secures protective orders quickly with the connections he has. He looks so tired. It must have been so easy to protect me when I was small, when he could be the barrier between me and the monsters he dealt with on a daily basis. But that time had long since passed. All he could do now was make phone calls and pray to a God he didn't believe in. He did not tell me about the journal left on the doorstep until years later. The one that he didn't turn over to the police. The one that had photos of me sleeping. Photos of me naked fresh out the shower. Even some of me kissing my ex-boyfriend. Adam's face in these was scratched out and left hollow. All of them taken, at times I had assumed I was alone. I arranged to stay the night with Carly. She tells me the next morning that I had started screaming in my sleep, and I did not stop until she crawled into bed with me and wrapped her in her tiny arms. I am grateful to her. I think her touch is what kept me from remembering any nightmares I had that night. It felt so good to just sleep. We moved soon afterwards, my father and I. We spoke of the incident only once more, when I walked into the kitchen of the new house and saw my father at the table with bourbon in his hands, flipping through a mound of papers with the other. They were the letters from Blueberry. He had retrieved them after evidence processed them. He intended to put them away in his safety deposit box. I'll never forget the grim reasoning behind his voice as the lawyer in him spoke. Well, if you ever turn up murdered, at least I'll have this and the journal to prove exactly who did it. I haven't seen or heard of Blueberry since that day. Every summer since I was four, my nana took me and my sisters to California. I always loved going, since she had a pool and let me drive around on her golf cart. I blame teenage angst, since I was turning 15 that summer. But I threw a huge fit to my mum over going. I had just gotten a boyfriend and didn't want to go long distance for a month. And all three of my younger sisters were going to tag along. Meaning that I had to babysit. Mum put her foot down 
told me to suck it up, so obviously I was going to be a pretty pissy teen the whole time. So in the beginning of June, we loaded up in Nana and Papa's van and headed off. I live on a small coastal town in Oregon, so the trip was going to take around two days to get all the way down to Palm Springs. Looking back on it, I was totally miserable to be around. Picking on my sisters, ignoring my grandparents, huffing and puffing the entire time. So, I really didn't blame them for what they did. A day had passed since we finally made it to the rental home. When my mum called all of a sudden, excitedly, telling me that since I was older, I was getting a chance to travel that is fully paid for, and that I should be grateful. I interrupted her saying, we go to Cali every year, so why is she so stoked about this trip? No kiddo, your aunt Pat is flying you out to stay with her for the next two months. She's paying for all of it. Isn't that so nice? I was so confused and just stood there listening to her ramble on about the trip. And then I got pissy. What do you mean two months? Doesn't she live in Texas? Why am I going to Texas? I was livid. Well, turns out that Papa had grown pretty tired of my teenage moods pretty fast, and rightfully so, and complained about it to his sister, Aunt Pat. She told him to send me to her, and it would be a good experience for me. All expenses paid. Nana and Papa didn't seem to have an issue with it, and neither did my mum. I, on the other hand, saw plenty. My first thoughts were of my boyfriend back home, naturally. And being bored and alone in Texas wasn't looking like a fun option either. I begged and begged my mum to let me stay in Cali but she insisted that I had to go on a learning experience. So the next two days, I was completely sullen, until I was dropped off at the airport. It wasn't until I was actually boarding that I realised I hadn't seen my Aunt Pat or her husband Rick since the age of seven. The only form of communication I had with them was the annual Christmas card with the attached $10. To be honest, I didn't even remember what they looked like. I tried texting my mum at a last ditch effort to get out of it. But nope, the plane ticket was paid for and I was already boarded. She argued back that I was exaggerating, that it was my papa's sister, so I would be fine. And to quit complaining or she'd cut my phone off completely as punishment. So I strapped up and flew to Texas. I didn't get to the airport until late and was worried that they had forgotten about me. I get to the waiting area and even though we were the only people there, save for one old Latino man, they were waiting with a sign plastered with my name on it. I gave a meek smile and a wave and they ran up excitedly, asking about my flight and whatnot. They were an older couple Older than I thought they were, with matching grey hair and oddly tall. They were both dressed like tourists, with a Hawaiian dress shirt and khakis, and Rick had shades on with a safari hat, even though we were inside. I figured that they were just weird old people and brushed it off. We arrived back at their house, a really nice one, in a rich senior living area. Aunt Pat showed me around the house and led me to the spare room which I would occupy and left me be. I instantly called my boyfriend, let him know that I landed safely and told him about the flight and how weird my relatives were. Since I was off on my sleeping schedule, I ended up sleeping until noon the next day. I groggily rolled out of bed and walked downstairs to grab some breakfast and I was met with a note on the fridge, explaining that they were both at the store and would be back soon. I ate, got dressed, and waited. 
they pulled up shortly after and whisked into the house with a huge bag. Auntie Pat handed me the sack and grinned. We got you a little present. We're both just so excited you're here. I opened it up to reveal a hideous star-spangled banner dress and an accompanying hairpiece. It was so horrendous, but as rude of a teen as I was, I wasn't point-blank disrespectful. I gave them both a huge smile and thanks. Rick pulled out the dress and let it unfold in all its glory. We walk in the summer parade every year and we want you to walk with us. Our roundabout is the flag theme this year. Why don't you go and try it on? Make sure it fits. Weirdly, it fit just fine, much to their delight. The parade was in three days, and until then, we would do sightseeing around Texas. For those three days, I was completely ill-tempered. Everything they were doing was making me want to scream. I was so annoyed and irritable. They drone on about one thing, argue off tangents about another, that my teenage body did not want to keep up with. Waking up very early to go on snail pace walks, quick to bed at night, with no TV. Just basic old people lifestyle. But to a teen, it was hell. All of the tourist spots they took me to were very bland, and I was not in the mood to be appreciative. Whether they were starting to get annoyed with me or not, they never showed it. I wouldn't have cared if they were anyway. I figured they'd just send me home early if I did get on their nerves enough with my moodiness. So the big day comes around, and I'm garbled up in my outfit ready to die of humiliation. The parade was pretty long, walking about three miles through the neighbourhood. I half waved and fake smiled the entire way through, then followed the giant barbecue, which went on until late at night. Aunt Pat told me to stick close to them and not to wander off since I'd get lost pretty quickly. After about an hour of being glued to them, they started to keep less of an eye on me and focused on their friends. I walked off to get some food and decided to keep walking. It was a nice night out and felt good to get some fresh air and freedom. I watched some kids play with sparklers, adults laughing loudly and spilling their beers and started to feel a bit better. I kept strolling on, having a good time people watching. When I saw two little girls sprint across the street a couple of blocks down from me, waving sparklers, I grinned thinking about my own little sisters, when I noticed a weird shadow just beyond where the kids had ran. My smile dropped, and I froze, peering harder to make out what it was. Then the shadow moved quickly, following where the girls did. I figured it was probably just one of their parents, but the hair standing on the back of my neck said otherwise. I decided there wasn't any harm in following, just to make sure my subconscious was wrong, and I jogged down the street. I made it to where I saw the girls run by, and looked down the road to check if I could see them. There was a little play structure at the end of the street for the neighbourhood kids to play on, and I guessed they probably ran down there to play. I made it to the park, and heard giggles coming from the tube slide and a small pile of burnt-out sparklers on the ground below the entrance. I glanced around, and didn't see anyone creepy. In fact, I didn't even see a parent nearby. Knowing if my sisters did this, my mother would be livid. It was dark out, and no one was around for at least five blocks before the party, and it was getting cold and late. I made my presence known to not scare the kids, and pretended to get a phone call so they could hear my voice and know I was a girl, hopefully someone they felt they could trust. 
Oh, hey, yeah, I'm down at the little park waiting for you. See you soon. The giggle stop, and the little faces peered out. They couldn't have been more than four or five years old. I waved hello to them, and asked them if they were having fun. They nodded, and clambered out. I know how to talk to little kids, since I've been around so many of them for such a long time, and they warmed up to me pretty fast. While playing with them for a little bit, I asked them where their parents were, and if they knew where they lived. They ignored me, and continued to drag me around to play games. I really like your dress, it looks like mine. My grandma got it for me. One of them did a quick spin for me to show off her bedazzled flag dress. I remembered then that all the cul-de-sacs were themed, and figured that they had to live in one of the houses around Aunt Pat's. I asked if they walked to the parade, and they nodded, and went off telling me about how fun it was riding the float. They had a big flag float in our section, so they must have been up on it, and I didn't see them since I spent most of my time zoned out. As I was playing Super Sleuth, I saw a shadow move from down the street towards the park. I got the heebie-jeebies again, and kept my eye on it. The girls had crawled back into the slide during this time, and were trying to get me to catch them. Something came over me, and I told them to keep quiet for just a little bit, that we were going to play a joke on someone. They loved the idea, thank God, and cupped their hands to their mouths with big grins. By the time the shadow figure was within the lamppost that illuminated the park, I could see him clearly. He looked like a normal guy, middle-aged, just slightly dishevelled. The closer he got to me though, the worse I felt. I was sitting on the swing, acting like I was texting when he came up to me. Have you seen my girls anywhere? I lost them up at the parade. He peered around the playground quickly. I hoped they'd come here to play. He trailed off and gave me a nervous laugh. His story seemed to add up, but then again, the girls only mentioned Grandma. Oh no, I haven't, but I could keep an eye out for them. What are their names? This was the true test, since the girls had already told me their names during me quizzing them. Uh, um, Emma and Ava. Two little girls? Blonde? Haven't seen them? Wrong. Their names weren't even close to what he just bullshitted with. My creep I meter shot up. I shook my head. No. Then apologised. And went back to my phone. Since Aunt Pat was tech illiterate, she doesn't text. Which left me stuck waiting on this dude to leave. So that I could call her and explain what was happening. Instead... He decides to pop a squat down on the swing next to me. Great. He starts to make small talk with me, asking where I lived around here, what my name was, and if I had a boyfriend. I keep my answers short, making up a fake name, saying my dad was coming to get me soon, and his questions then started to get more personal. If I was on my period, how old I was, if I was a virgin, I snapped at him and asked him why he was bothering me, and that he should be out looking for his kids. That's when I saw the knife. He shifted in the swing and his shirt went up, revealing a huge knife clipped to his pocket. I tried acting like I didn't see it, as I pulled out my phone to text my boyfriend to call 911. The guy snatched my cell and kept asking for my passcode, wanting to see if I had nudes on my phone. I was scared to piss him off, and worried if I started yelling it would scare the girls into making noise. I started acting like I was into him, keeping him calm, hopefully get him away from the kids long enough for me to help in some fashion. I laughed and said I didn't have nudes, but he insisted on getting my passcode. I claimed it was some random four digit number, and it locked him out of my phone. He tossed it back to me and said the phone was busted. He then got up and asked me to come and help him look for his girls, 
that it would be much faster to search if I did. He pointed off down the street he'd come from and insisted they must have gone that way. I stood up slowly, trying to stall and figuring out what to do, but he slipped an arm around my waist and herded me off. Maybe I should go the opposite way, cover more ground. I tried to peel away from him, but his grip was tight. No, they went this way. No use splitting up. He kept coming up with excuses to keep me there, and I was terrified of what would happen if he got mad so I stayed quiet. His hand kept travelling down my ass and groping it, and it took every ounce of me not to break into sobs right there. I felt so stupid. What was my plan? I left the girls alone. I'm alone with a crazy person, and no one knows where either of us are. Then I heard the sweet sound of sandals slapping on pavement, and a booming voice yell out, What do you think you're doing? Uncle Rick had come to save the day. He was running down the sidewalk towards me, as fast as 75-year-old Rick can go, which apparently was pretty fast. The guy suddenly let go of me and whipped out his knife, aiming at Rick. I ran away and started yelling to my uncle that he had a knife. Apparently, my aunt and uncle both have concealed weapon permits. And why wouldn't they? It's Texas. He whipped out his gun and started yelling at me to get back. The man's eyes grew wide as he throws the knife in Rick's direction and turns to run and hop to fence and keeps on running through someone's yard and kept going. Rick lowered his gun and ushered me to him and I started choking out what happened between sobs. He kept his cool the entire time and wrapped me in a big bear hug. We went back to the park and I crawled inside the tube and find the little girls curled up at the bottom together asleep. Rick called Aunt Pat and I woke up the kids, congratulating them on staying so well and quiet. We all climbed out of there when Aunt Pat showed up in her car. I got a good lecture from her and so did the girls. Apparently, Aunt Pat knew them and their grandma and loaded us up and took us back to the barbecue, which was now shut down and replaced with a search party and police. The girls ran back to their grandma and I had to explain what happened to the police and gave a description of the guy. Turned out they had multiple calls on him for hovering around the playground and following kids home from the bus stop. They were surprised when I said Rick hadn't shot the guy, just scared him. And the cops turned to my uncle and asked why he didn't. And Rick gestures to me. She's from Oregon. Didn't want to make her liberal ass shit itself. The next day, Aunt Pat woke me up early and drove me to a gym, where she then paid for a trainer to give me self-defense lessons for the rest of the time I was in Texas. After the incident, I was much less of a dickhead teen and did a 180 on my mood. Aunt Pat didn't even call to tell my mum, saying there was no point of worrying her if we handled it. I don't know if they ever caught the creep, but I definitely have the skill set now to handle him if I ever run into him or someone like him again. I just hope I never do. I'll leave being a badass to Uncle Rick and Aunt Pat. In 2013, I was 21 years old and studying abroad in South America with my college roommate. I had more than one unsettling encounter down there, but I am an experienced traveller and generally have good instincts. So I can't say I have many other thrilling stories aside from narrowly dodging a few muggings, other than the general sense of unease that comes with being a solo female traveller. Well, pair of solo female travellers. Our four month stay was relatively unexciting. Relatively. At the end of our programme, we decided to stay for extra time and do some more casual backpacking. We ended up deciding to hike the Inca Trail. It's amazing. For anyone considering it, for the unfamiliar, you start in one location, 
which varies depending on the trek you choose. And then, you end up in a small town near Machu Picchu, called Aguas Calientes. Your return trip is covered by your hiking company, unless you choose to stay, in which case you get a refund. Well, we were in a new town, and our hiking company left immediately after lunch, and we wanted to spend the night and get the most out of being in that part of the country. The time came, and we said farewell to 11 of our 12 hiking companions, and were joined by one other of our new friends, who was planning on starting an additional hike in the morning. Our guides gave us our refunds, and gave us very careful instructions on how to get back to Cusco, the city that we had officially departed from. When you're ready to leave, make your way to the train station right there. Don't go anywhere else. It's a very official and safe train. Once you get to the last stop, go to the official bus station and it will bring you back to Cusco. We understood, thanked them and parted ways. That night, we went out drinking with the remaining member of our hiking party. He didn't drink much because of his gruelling hike the next day. But we had a blast and felt safer for having a male with us. Overall, we made sure to keep our wits about us. And it turned out to be a very fun night without incident. We made our way back to the hostel and wished him well on his travels. Went to bed, ready to explore the town the next day before catching the train home. We have our fun, and then we make our way to the train station. It's a very nice train station, not like the ones I take in the US. Maybe even nicer. It definitely felt very safe. The train pulls into the final station, and we begin trying to locate the bus station. We ask a gentleman who clearly works at the stop, and he points and tells us to walk about a half mile in that direction and that we would not be able to miss it. We thank him and we continue. I want to pause here for emphasis. All of these conversations and the ones that follow are entirely in Spanish. This isn't too important, but it is good for you to understand that I was speaking a language that I am extremely proficient in, but not fluent. It's not too difficult for native speakers to talk quickly and avoid being understood. We walk for what actually does not seem like enough time, less than half mile for sure, before coming across a bus station. I'm shocked to say the least, but I'm also reminding myself that I come from a much nicer part of the world and that I needed to put aside my preconceived notions. It had a sign clearly labelling the bus station, and it says, To Cusco, right on the sign. To be clear, it's not a fake sign. It's similar to a sign marking a gas station from a freeway. Think big pole, and the actual sign was probably 50 feet in the air. It could not have been a contemporary trick. Otherwise, I would have been much more suspicious. Aside from that sign, though, well, it was something all right. The buses were the classic bad news white vans. You know those ones? Again, I checked myself. How many people could possibly travel to Cusco in a day here? It wouldn't make sense that you have a giant 20-seater bus doing the trek every day. There's a tiny wooden building, presumably an office, underneath the big sign. But we didn't need to go in there as there were two gentlemen standing outside near the vans. We asked them if the vans are going to Cusco, though we can clearly read on the sign that they are, and the men confirm. We ask how much the tickets cost, and when they're planning on departing. They give us the price, and say that they leave in five to ten minutes, and then direct us to a van and sit in and wait. We both sit down. And I admit it, I was uneasy. Again, 
I am an experienced traveller, and I do know not to expect mon luxuries in the less developed parts of the world, and there's nothing outwardsly sinister about this bus stop, but it just wasn't what I was expecting, even for the area. My roommate does not seem to be sharing any of my trepidation, however. She's a bit more sheltered and generally trusting, so that's fair in character for her. I'm also an over-worrier, so between us, we are probably both on the more extreme sides of the appropriate emotion. Me, silently freaking out, and her a little too relaxed. We wait for ten minutes in the van, which we've left the doors open due to heat. We are just talking and swatting flies, which are buzzing in and out of the open door. I'm unsurprised that we're not on schedule, as I know they're trying to avoid wasting a tank of gas on two passengers and are trying to wait for more people. But we have an hour's drive ahead of us and I want to get going. So I ask, and they tell us five more minutes. Sure. More time passes and I can't shake the feeling that we aren't at the right bus station though nobody made mention of there being more than one in a tiny town. So I keep telling myself that I was being irrational. I decide to go see if anybody is in the office and just get more information. I open the door and walk in without much hesitation, given its positioning under the giant sign. While well, I walk into what is clearly a residence and there are 15 sweaty Peruvians cooking beans and looking as shocked as me to see them. I stammer out, uh, is this the bus station? They look confused and go, oh, the bus? Yeah, the bus. Go outside, talk to the guys. Bus to Cusco. I back out and apologize for intruding. I go back to the van to report the experience to my roommate. Right as another girl walks up and says, Bus to Cusco? She is clearly a native Spanish speaker and not a foreign tourist. The men immediately say yes and place her in a different van, which makes no sense if they're trying to fill one van to take us to the same place. This gives me out more than anything else that's happened yet. I pop my head into the van and tell my roommate to keep hanging tight. I walk over to the other van where she is waiting alone, and I ask her if she's going to Cusco. She confirms this to be the case, and I explain that we're going there as well, and I'm not sure why that we would be in separate vans. She says she doesn't know, but looks generally unconcerned. I go back to our van. My roommate was still in there. She hadn't left, and we'd been there for probably 30 to 40 minutes at this point. I start expressing my concerns to her, but she's being somewhat dismissive, which I can't blame her for, as I am a generally anxious person, and she's more used to that than anyone. We get pretty quiet and resign ourselves to waiting, still swatting flies and dabbing our brows with our shirts. I'm now sitting quietly, with my mind going wild with possibilities, and extremely suspicious something is wrong but also conceding that there's nothing too concrete justifying my level of concern. At this point, I'm now picturing some ploy to adopt foreigners, or being generally murdered. It's not a good feeling. The flies are driving me absolutely mad at this point, and now I've decided they're probably hovering about the car because somebody was murdered in there, and the blood wasn't cleaned well enough to fool the flies. At this point, I'm just torturing myself. The train of thought continues, and I look up. Hundreds of flies are crawling on the roof of the van. I realise we hadn't noticed, because only a few would be flying around at the time. And the van was rather suspicious, and my roommate and I were closer to the front, while the mass of them was grouping on the back. I'm frozen in fear at this point. Unsure if this was confirming my theory that somebody was murdered in the car 
or if I'm really letting my imagination run wild, and there are less remarkable things than flies in South American vans. I am basically hyperventilating, and I wish I could emphasise how many flies there were. I gesture upwards to my roommate, who looks up and appears shocked. At this point, I can assume I'm shaking my head and muttering. Right at this happens, the other van with the native girl begins to pull away, and I make a snap decision. I launch myself out of our van and start sprinting, and slam my hand on her van to bring it to a stop. She opens the door in shock, I grab the door to hold it open, and say more forcefully than I thought I had it in me, We're coming with you! I look back to my roommate who was staring at me, and I yell, Grab our bags and run! Now! She knew better than to mess with me when I was in crisis mode, and comes sprinting out of the other van, with both packbacks in hand, while I keep my hand on the door. The two men come running after her, saying, Don't go! We leave now! We leave for Cusco now! As I shove my friend into their car screaming, Sorry, we're riding with our friend here, and slam the door closed. The native girl, looking unsettled, just tells the driver that we're friends and to drive. At this point, I didn't know that this driver isn't in on whatever. At this point, I didn't know that this driver wasn't in on whatever I was afraid of, or if he was, but they didn't plan on messing with a local. Either way, I just saw her as our best bet. We pull onto the road and drive for a few minutes when I see it. You guessed it, the bus station. A very official, legitimate looking bus station with actual buses, which is probably about a half mile from the train. I have no doubt this is where we were supposed to go, and feel the blood drain from my face. I thought about jumping out of the van and running, but in a split second I questioned if it wasn't for official group tours or anything else, and I may not be considering. And my worst fear is ending up back at the first place, with our new local friend. As we drive, I'm looking for street signs, landmarks, or anything to indicate we're actually heading to Cusco. All I see is wide open desert plains and nothing. I sat the rest of the way driven in fear collecting a pile of makeshift weapons from what I could find in the back of the van. This included a sharp piece of car, likely from a previous collision, and a smallish fire extinguisher. I told myself if anybody tried to hurt us, I would kill them, and then try to figure out how to avoid a Peruvian prison sentence. I spent the entire car ride telling myself that I had it in me to kill a person if they tried to harm me. I gripped my weapons until my knuckles turned white, when suddenly the van came to a stop, very much in the middle of nowhere. The driver accepts a phone call, which I can't understand, then gets off the phone and slowly tells us he just remembered he can't take us all the way to Cusco. The native girl looks concerned, which makes me even more paranoid and he proceeds to point to a large but desolate building and tells us to go in there and to find a ride the rest of the way. Looking back, I'm not sure how I avoided throwing up from my anxiety and fear. The three of us joined in there, my weapons abandoned as I couldn't sneak them out the van, and people just kept pointing us further and further back, until we came back to an opening leading outside. I wanted to run, to somehow undo the entire journey, but we really had no other choice than to stick with the native girl. We had no alternate methods of transport, and there were no civilization in sight. And honestly, I'm not even sure what part of the country we're in. All that I know is that we are 60 to 90 minutes away from wherever the train stopped, and hopefully in the direction of Cusco. We get another van, this time with the opposite direction, and they are insisting that we fit over 10 people into a seven-seater van. They try and take my backpack, saying it needs to go on the roof, that backpacks had my passport and every resource I would most certainly want in an emergency. I'm thinking 
they could take it over my dead body, which very well may be happening. Right as I see my roommate happily passing hers to the lady. I grab her arm angrily and ready to ask her what the hell is going on with her survival instincts. But my face must have said it all because she backs up and uncertainly tells the lady never mind. She will be keeping her bag with her. The lady looks aggravated and said that they won't fit in the car with all the people and I tell her that we will be happy to hold them as I climb in and demonstrate in a way that will require her to force either me or the bag out. She relents and my roommate crawls in. We sit in the back with our backpacks towering in our laps in front of us, my roommate looking somewhat inconvenienced that I've made her do this. Honestly, maybe I was overreacting, but better than underreacting. We drove for a long while and we finally entered the city borders of Cusco. On the one hand, I'm relieved because I now know we're exactly where we're supposed to be. And on the other hand, the surrounding areas outside the main square are extremely dangerous shanty towns. And we were the only foreigners with giant backpacks on a bus. No sooner am I thinking, well, at least that was close, when the bus driver turns to me and says he didn't want to drive further and we can figure out the rest of our way home. Even the native girl immediately goes on red alert and offers to pay more if he will take us to the city square. He declines, kicks us out of the bus and drives away. We're looking at all the people staring openly at us and she asks in a scared voice if she wants to split a cab. We agree immediately. The problem is this part of the world, the cab is often the first car to drive up and assures you they'll take you where you want to go. Not very official. This is exactly what happens. A Corolla from 1993 pulls up and tells us to hop in. Our friend looks wary, but decides it's better than winging it out in the open. He drops us in the town square without incident. And at this point, the native girl looks like she's aged five years since we first crossed paths with her a few hours ago. I'm sure I looked even worse. She meekly says, well, I'm glad we got here safely. And I can barely talk, I'm so exhausted and respond. Me too, thanks. And we part ways. I had a few incidences on this trip that made me a believer that no matter where you are, one traumatic experience makes wherever you are the last place you slept feel like home. Let me tell you, that hostel bed felt just like home. This happened about 10 years ago, when I was 12 years old. And much to my tomboy horror, I had some serious boobs, which I was just getting past the stage of trying to cover up with bandages, Mulan style. My older sister Jen had come back from a year abroad in China and she had brought back these shirts that were tailored specifically for us, as we emailed her the measurements. Mine was red and black, and tied up on the sides, creating this draping effect that made my too large chest look even more happening. I'm not going to even go into my newly formed accompanying childbearing hips, but basically imagine a short haired tomboy with an hourglass figure from hell. Long story short, I looked a lot older than I was, but inevitably I was still a dumb kid. My dad had always been pretty careful and protective with us growing up, but especially with me. I grew up in a tiny village in British Columbia, Canada. But we had to move to Toronto, Ontario, for my dad's work when I was about 10. I was a really social kid and would introduce myself to strangers on the bus or street, giving them my full name, address and birthday in the first line. You know, in case I got lost. 
That was when my parents decided that I was a little too street smart deficient. So they signed me up for self-defense courses. And what I guess you'd call rape prevention courses geared towards kids. You know, don't follow Uncle Sam into the blue play tube kind of thing. Honestly, pretty scarring. Anyway, it was pretty creepy. I don't think it taught me more than what I already guess in an uncomfortable situation, but it did really up my paranoia, which was the main idea when you're dealing with a small town kid living in a big city. The scary shit didn't happen in Toronto though. This happened back home in my tiny village of British Columbia. So, trying back on what we know, endowed 12 year old takes self defense courses to protect herself from big city predators in suspiciously azure colored playground equipment. The village that I grew up in was incredibly tiny. I mean, this is Canada. So it took up a huge amount of landmass, but the place was mostly forested logging roads that crazy settlers decided to turn into farmland. We had about 100 permanent residents in the village and about 50 people living down in the campground trailer park during the summer. When we moved away, my aunt and her boyfriend Steve took over our ranch. My aunt and Steve aren't necessarily the best people. She had a pretty rough childhood. And Steve is one of those greasy oil rig guys who thinks the best way to coexist with nature is to kill everything that comes within range. Despite my weird ass relatives, we stayed at the ranch for a few weeks every summer so that my dad could help patch the place up while my siblings and I met up with our old childhood friends and neighbours. This was one of the more reacquainting kind of days. So I set off down the road in my red black shirt from China to visit the Martins about half a kilometre or less down the road. As luck would have it, they weren't home. So I headed back towards my house. And past the driveway, I didn't feel like going back to the house. So I walked down the forested main road to get to Mr. Footsie's place about two kilometers away. I was about half a kilometer past the house when a car drove up on the road. This was the middle of the day. So it's not like the thing just rolled up out of a dark mist on the shady streets of a vermin ridden town, but I definitely caught a vibe from it. It was out of the ordinary for two reasons. Number one, it was a car in a logging country where pretty much everyone drove a Jeep or a truck. It was slowing down and there was a third reason too. The driver was seriously staring at me. I suddenly got a real predator vibe from this guy. And he looked like your average blonde guy in his mid to late twenties. I grew up in the wild, surrounded by wolves, bears and mountain lions. But I've never felt more watched in that way than by this guy on the road. And unfortunately, one of my mum's creepy ass boyfriends. The car was slowing down and looked like it would stop right in front of me. It was in the middle of the day, but no one from my house or Mr. Footsie's would have been able to see me on the road because of the tree cover. Luckily, I knew the old ranch like the back of my hand and I figured I was pretty close to a half paved trail leading down to the chicken coop. The car was just about to stop when I bolted past it about 15 meters. Then I crashed into the bush on the side of the road. I've got to say, I felt pretty stupid running away from a random slow moving car at the time. 
but I figured it was better to look stupid than to be dead. I heard the guy's car door close, and then he called out really loud, Hello? Now I'm not saying it was creepy just yet, but the hairs on my neck stuck up, like it pissed cat's fur. I thought I was pretty safe, crouching in that first few meters of bush. My heart was already racing, but I didn't think this dude would try following me in. I figured he was just a guy from the city, looking from directions from the wrong kid. Then I heard him crash into the bush. He was up from me, about where he parked his car, and he was fumbling around the bush, breaking sticks around him like a bear, and calling out long hellos. From where I was, I could see the trail to the chicken coop, and inched over there as quietly as I could. My older brother and I were pretty into sneaking attacks on each other, so I knew how to move around pretty quietly in the forest. Things had gotten too quiet though. Buddy had stopped moving. He was turned away from me, looking up towards the house, which was on a serious slope from where we were. Crab crouched in the weeds in front of him, trying to stay low to the ground in case he turned around. I started to get scared that he would hear me breathing. I'd never been at all good at hide and seek. I'd usually get scared and start hyperventilating for a few minutes, until I'd get lightheaded, and then I'd just give myself up. I knew that if I didn't run, then I'd faint, or he'd hear me. I had about 10 meters of bush across from him, and the trail was right there in front of me. So I fought that giving up feeling, and I bolted. I ran full tilt down the path towards the chicken coop, which was luckily behind two storage sheds that I didn't even consider hiding in. I closed the coop door, and looked back on the path behind me. It widened out into more of a dirt road once you made it past the bush and I could see the guy walking down it, and turning into the first storage shed, where we kept the snowmobiles. He took a while in there, and then moved on to the next one. Unfortunately, it was so easy to see what he was up to, because the chicken coop was basically a relic, and essentially see-through from all the gaps in the wood. I figured he'd be able to make out the red on my shirt once he was looking in the right direction, so I knew I wasn't out of the woods yet. To get up to the house, I'd have to run up the slope, which was essentially the steepness of Pride Rock. You could hardly even walk the thing without slipping back down, and from what I could see, the guy was blonde and cocky enough to follow me this far, and a fully developed man who was probably about six foot tall and I was maybe five foot and pubertly awkward. So I left the coop, got myself to the bottom of the hill, and I must have unconsciously prayed to some mighty ass mountain goat spirit, because I ran up that hill so fast, I don't even remember my feet touching the ground, until I was a few minutes away from the top. I reached for the basement doors, which, for the first time in my life, were unlocked. Mountain god goats are thorough. As soon as I got past the doors, I locked them behind me and screamed bloody murder for my dad, which is just another way of saying extremely loud. I didn't scream very much as a kid, so my dad was down the stairs and in the basement within about a third of a nanosecond. I don't even remember if I told them what was up, or if I just bawled, but Steve busted out of the house waving his gun around, like the crazy Albertan he was. The blonde guy down below sprinted out of the chicken coop, and back up through the bush to his car. Steve ran right past us, back out through the porch, and up the front drive, but the buddy was gone. 
Maybe mountain goat gods are impartial, or dude was just a triathlete. Either way, I was fine, but thoroughly creeped out, which I tried to hide, being the hard-as-nails, angst-ridden, boob-taping 12-year-old that I was. Steve figured that he was just a douchebag kid out to steal some of the farm equipment, but deep down, I still kind of think that if I hadn't have run, that I might have spent the past 10 years locked away in a stagnant basement somewhere. Anyway, boyfriend Steve became Uncle Steve, and now divorced Steve. But I like the guy a lot better than most of my blood relatives. Like I said before, we never called the police because my dad didn't think it would be a big deal. Or maybe he just figured it was over and didn't want me to think it was a big deal. I grew up to be very aware of my local secret paths and trails, which has maybe even saved my life a few other times. One very scary incident in Europe involving men with baseball bats. And obviously, I never wore that stupid shirt again. I also developed quite the aversion to blonde dudes. Sorry, Vikings. So, buddy, who was just hopefully looking for directions, and maybe a pet chicken to cuddle on the lonely winter nights, I profoundly hope we do not meet again. So this story happened to me when I was 15 years old. I was a super lonely kid. My home life was in shambles. Mom was cheating on dad and told me about it. And I had just started a new high school the year prior where I didn't know a soul. Creating art quickly became my biggest coping mechanism. To this day, I still love to draw. I discovered the website DeviantArt around this time and started submitting my drawings every day. Through this, I made some friends online of all ages. Some very talented people were giving me positive feedback on my work, and this really inspired me. In my deep depression, I felt like DeviantArt was a safe haven of like-minded people who appreciated one another. For the first time in a long time, I belonged somewhere. I spent many hours talking to some regulars on the site. Even now, ten years later, a few of them are still in my life, and I cherish their friendship. But this story is about someone who I certainly don't want to ever meet again. DeviantArt also allows writers to submit their stories or poetries to the site. One day, I was on the front page, and a poem caught my eye. It was more of an angry rant, full of weird, twisted imagery and anti-Christian subtext. Sounds stupid, I know, but I was actually quite well written and funny, at least to my 15-year-old self, being a very angry, depressed high schooler. I was drawn in and decided to check this artist out. Not only was he a prolific writer, with maybe a hundred poems and stories on his site, but this man was a very talented visual artist as well. He created amazing illustrations of weird and funny creatures. Some of them were a little sexual, like naked women, but most of them were humorous or gross. His name was Tom. The combination of Tom's writing and visual art intrigued me. Even though he was 30 years old, I decided to send him a private message. We bonded, and we soon began talking on AIM. I would look forward to talking to Tom every day, and came straight home after school to connect with him. Chatting for five hours was a daily thing for us. In hindsight, my family probably wondered what I was doing, but they never said a word. Anyway, 
Isolating myself in my room wasn't abnormal at this point. I was so grateful for my artistic friend. I could be as dark and confident as I wanted to be when we talked. I unloaded a lot of my pain onto him, and he told me about his troubles too. Tom even started to write poetry about me, happy poetry, and it made me feel very special, because I had softened this angry dude's heart with my friendship, or so I was led to believe. He was reliable, always online whenever I came home. After about three weeks of talking, Tom asked for my phone number because he wanted to hear my voice. I was extremely uncomfortable with this and reluctant. He insisted though, and gave me his number to call. Fearing I would lose a friend who was important to me, I finally gave in. I should mention that I'm 23 now, and I'm still a shy person. But at 15, I was painfully awkward and detested phone calls. My heart was racing, and I was shaky and sweaty as the phone rang. Tom picked up. Hello? My voice sounded shaky, and Tom spoke. I knew his age, but to my relief, he sounded like a teenage boy, and this made me feel less uncomfortable, but still weirded out. I had no idea what to talk about, and for some reason I felt like crying. Tom and I spoke for a bit. He laughed at the awkward things I said, so I guess the conversation went all right. Honestly, I can't remember what we talked about, and all I remember is that he barely spoke at all. We got off the phone and talked online more. He said how happy he was to hear my voice. I was still pretty upset, but glad that I didn't disappoint him. I hoped that he wouldn't ask me to call him again though, because it was a very stressful experience but I had poured so much time into talking to this man that I was willing to be uncomfortable to preserve our friendship. My self-esteem was non-existent. The next day, Tom wanted to talk again. On the phone, I could hear him breathing heavily. He was masturbating. I talked about my day at school, some random thoughts, and he stayed silent apart from the breathing. Then, when I was about mid-sentence, he hung up on me. When I asked him what happened over Instant Messenger, he told me I wasn't talking about anything sexy, or something along those lines. I apologised, and felt a sense of total failure. The conversations then turned sexual. I told him that I was a virgin, and in reality, I hadn't even had a first kiss. Tom was overjoyed by this. Now, I really had his attention. At this point, it was May, and our relationship progressed to the point that I let him jerk off to my voice, and even sent him some pictures of me in my underwear when he asked. I had no idea what I was doing, but felt like I had to obey him or he wouldn't be my friend. He started to write poetry about taking a girl's virginity. To his fans on DeviantArt, they were just fictional poems about a fictional girl. But I knew that they were really for me. This both thrilled me and made me queasy. My 16th birthday was coming up in June. Tom and I constantly talked about how badly we wanted to see each other. In the back of my mind, I really missed the days before everything got so sexual. I told him there was no way I could ever fly to Florida, where he lived, and Tom insisted on seeing me before my 16th birthday. Eventually, we picked a date. He found a hotel near my family's house that was relatively affordable, 
and even bought tickets to fly out. The plan was that I would skip school that day and spend the day with him so that he could take my virginity. I can't remember if he was even going to stay more than a day, to be honest. Before we said our good nights, Tom wrote, Will you let me get your ass too? Not a question, a statement. I came home from school one day, and my mum was extremely solemn. She told me that she knew about Tom. Apparently, I had remained signed in on AOL. But I think she actually got my password to see what I was up to. I began to cry and defend Tom at first, but then I admitted I was terrified of him. I was so ashamed that my mum saw our sexual conversations. But she hugged me and told me, he won't be coming, I promise. She emailed Tom, which really spooked him. Tom began to yell at me and blow up on the phone. He told me he spent $500 on the plane tickets and that he couldn't get them back. I never picked up any of his calls and he wrote me tons of emails in all the caps and I still have a few of them saved. He wrote angry, violent poetry on DeviantArt about how I betrayed him. I was devastated and hated myself. On the day Tom was supposed to come visit, I stayed at my best friend's house, which was miles away in a totally different community. My mother gave our apartment building a photo of Tom to make sure nobody let him in. I was totally paranoid that he would pop up for a while after that, but he never did. In fact, I didn't hear from him at all. He stopped submitting any art or poetry. Over a month went by, and Tom was still MIA. My family and I went to Canada for a music festival. Life was slowly going back to normal, and my guilt was somewhat fading. When suddenly, in our hotel room, my phone rang. It was Tom. I tried to pick up, and I can't remember why, but for some reason since we were in Canada, I couldn't talk to him. I think it's because I had an American service provider or something. In any event, he left me messages. My memory is very foggy. He may have actually been texting me. I can't remember at all. A few days later, we took a train back to the US, and as soon as we crossed the border, I sent him a text. I apologised for what happened and explained that I was in Canada, but that I missed him and I hoped he could forgive me. Tom told me the reason he was gone for so long. He said that on the day he was supposed to come and see me, he got very drunk and tried to kill himself. He stabbed himself all over, including his stomach, left hand and legs. Feeling last minute regret, he called his mother and she called the police. He told me that his whole apartment was considered a biohazard from all the blood. And after he recovered, he spent time in the psych ward. Tom had mutilated himself so badly that the hospital had to amputate his leg and he lost two fingers which he told me was all my fault. I was utterly speechless, and my blood ran cold. I refused to believe him. But lo and behold, he uploaded some pictures of himself on DeviantArt. His leg was amputated above the knee, and he was missing fingers. I had seen previous photos of him, and this was my friend all right. It's hard to explain how I feel about this situation. Obviously, I feel very sad for Tom, but I also understand that this wasn't my fault. I was a lonely child and desperate for a friend. Tom was a schizophrenic man and a paedophile, and was later revealed by his explicit poetry about little girls. Eventually, he was banned from DeviantArt, and I never talked to him again after age 16. A few years ago, I looked him up and found his profile on a different site. Admittedly, 
I was googling him to see if he was still alive. In his profile picture, he was next to a young woman with his hand over her mouth. It looked like he found someone who was willing to visit him, after all. I am a petite, 24 year old female from the mainland of the US. But this story takes place when I was 19 and living in Oahu, Hawaii. Now, the area I lived in was really, really ghetto. And being half white, half Guamian, but light skinned, I was the closest thing to a white person in the entire city I lived in. Whenever I told the local where I lived, they'd give me a funny look, like I was crazy or lying. This is relevant later. So, because where I lived had absolutely no jobs, and I was living in my Hawaiian ghetto, with my cousins who were all carless, I had to take two buses for an hour to work, both ways. The day this happened, I was working for a co-worker who had a family emergency, and it was Sunday. I'd never worked on a Sunday before, and this shift was from 2pm till 10.30. No big deal. There's a bus stop right next to my work, and they run until midnight. Right? Wrong. Buses stop running at 10pm on Sundays. I found out the fun way. So here I am, standing in a bus stop alone for about 40 minutes. Businesses all around me are closing. It's getting darker and darker. And I am starting to panic. I'm completely alone. Save for the occasional hooker and John wandering around looking for dark alleys and crystal meth. Hawaii is scary at night. Don't believe the paradise hype. Outside of Waikiki and North Shore. All of a sudden... Some homeless, toothless meth head pops out of nowhere and says, Hey, haole, which is a bad word for white person, and basically tells me that I have to walk my skinny ass home because no buses run this late. I realize how screwed I am. My neighborhood is seriously dangerous, so even if I did manage to walk home safely, there's no way I'm walking through Cam Park at night alone. It just isn't happening. I open my purse and check my wallet, and find out that one of my cousins had indeed borrowed my last 50 bucks, but was nice enough to leave a little bit for the bus that wasn't coming. Meaning, I couldn't even call a cab. Oh, and my phone was dead. Because... There was some big shot GM at my work today, so I wasn't allowed to charge it at my cashier station, and didn't trust it alone in the break room. As I'm internally having a meltdown, a taxi cab pulls up in front of me. Windows down. Sorry dude, I'd love a ride, but I don't have any cash, I tell the driver. He looks at me, looks around and sighs. Well, where do you need to go? I can't leave you here now, now that I know you're here. I'll end up seeing you on the five o'clock news. I tell him my neighborhood, and he does a double take, then shrugs and motions for me to get into the back. So I happily ignore the foreboding feeling I have in the back of my mind. I've only been living here for two months, and my luck has been so shitty. I've been robbed, jumped, tricked into stealing, you name it, it happened. And though... They were very sneaky ways. I was just thinking at that moment, my luck was changing. And you guessed it, I was wrong for a second time that night. I hopped into the back seat, gave him my cross street near my house, and tell him I'll get his number and pay him later. Thank God I couldn't remember my address. Everything was normal for the first 20 minutes of the ride. Then he starts asking me very weird questions. How old are you? 
Are you a virgin? Are you married? Do you carry a gun in that big purse? I lie and tell him yes on the gun, starting to feel very creeped out. He stops talking after that for a bit, until he notices he's almost out of gas. I look. He really is almost out of gas. So we pull up at a gas station, but instead of parking next to the pump, he parks behind the building near a dumpster and says, I'm going to pay for gas and have a snack, and then I'll take you back. I start to say something about needing to get home and he cuts me off. You're riding for free. Let me eat my goddamn snack. I'm like, oh, okay, and consider bolting when he comes back. But I have no idea where we are or how to get home. So instead, when he leaves, I reach into the front and unlock all the doors, just in case. It was an older model, so I know they'd stay unlocked unless he manually locked them again. He comes back empty handed, no snack. Shit, am I the snack? Shit. He gets into the front seat, opens the middle console and pulls out a meth pipe, a bag of meth, a weed pipe, and some weed and a lighter. Let me have my snack, then we can go. He packs the meth pipe, takes a few hits and blows it at me. Then he starts passing it to me. I'm good for now, thanks. He looks pissed, but puts it down and grabs the weed pipe, repeating the process. I'm two seconds from bolting when he throws the car in reverse and leaves, without pumping any gas. Now holding the meth pipe again, and taking the occasional hit. What the hell? What the actual shit? I'm freaking out. This dude is going at 70 on a 30 lane, and is as high as a kite. But the scenery starts to look familiar, and I realise we're five minutes away from my house. I look over. Doors are still unlocked. Gotta think fast. His hand is slowly reaching for my knee, and he's looking right at me, not at the road, and he's moaning like my thigh is giving him the world's best orgasm. We're gonna have fun tonight, baby. I'll teach you how to take a dick. I tell him I'm not interested and he laughs. Your phone is dead. Who are you gonna call? Ghostbusters? We're in Kalihi, girl. His hand is still on my leg and he takes a left, away from the street I live on. I realised how screwed I am, but I'm oddly calm. I change tactics. Problem is, if I don't check in, they'll come looking for me. I'm down a party, but I gotta check in first. I am a little white girl. If you don't come home, they'll go check my work, and my co-workers saw me leave with you. And I don't want to get into any trouble. You know how white people are. I'm counting on the fact he doesn't know my family isn't white. I'm counting on the fact that he's high enough not to know I'm lying, and I'm counting on the fact that he didn't see that all my co-workers were gone. He gives me a weird look, and then hands me the meth pipe. Okay, howly girl, let's party. I hold up the pipe to my lips, wait for him to look towards the road, and emulate what I saw him doing. Turning it to the side, and, while lighting it, I produce a tiny bit of smoke. I don't inhale, and immediately blow out, hoping to God I don't get high, and never have to explain why there is meth in my system if I do get high. You're burning it! He gets pissed and grabs the hot end of the pipe from me, wasting my dinner. I'll show you how to do it right. He takes a hard right and I realise he's heading for the cross streets that I told him. My vision is a bit messed. Everything seems too bright, and my adrenaline starts to feel almost euphoric. Shit, am I high? Oh shit. The street I live on is wrapped around a hill, easily a mile wide across the streets, and we are roughly a quarter of a mile from my house. As we get close to the cross streets, he slows down, asking me what house it is. I lie and say I can't tell, and he slows down. It's so dark, and I just move there and all the houses look the same, and I'm high, and to please slow down. He obliges, 
and slows to about 5 miles an hour, and I make a break for it, swinging the door open and jumping out of the still moving vehicle. I can feel I am flying as I hit the dirt side of the sidewalk and crab walk until I can get onto my feet, and then I break out into a run. I probably looked like a lunatic, arms flailing, but I didn't give a single shit, nor did I bother looking back. The oldest cousin that I lived with was 39, male, and built like a Samoan. If I could get into my house, everything would be okay. That was all I could think. Plus, because he turned, we actually had passed my house, so he would have to drive to the next driveway and turn around because it was a narrow road. Plus, he was at the bottom of the hill, so he wouldn't be able to see which house I was in. I didn't see headlights, so I figured it was a good sign. Finally, I run into my front yard, unlocked the front door, relocked it, and slid down to the floor. I went to the front window and peeked out. No one on the street. No cabbie. Nothing. I was safe. Or so I thought. I ended up not telling anyone what happened, because I always got the same lecture when something bad happened to me. You were acting like some stupid little college white girl, if you're any smarter yada yada yada. But everything seemed okay. I started working day only shifts from then on, and avoided being alone or ever at the bus stop. And life went on. About a week later, I noticed a black car with tinted windows parked a few houses down from mine. Figured it was a neighbour's friend and brushed it off. Only, it was there the next day too. And the next. I finally asked one of my cousin's sons, who was about 17 at the time, if he'd seen it. And he said it showed up around 6 every day. Which is when I would get home from work. And I started freaking out. Finally, I broke down and told my giant cousin what happened, leaving out the meth part. Surprisingly, he didn't lecture me. He felt bad that I felt I couldn't come to him for support and apologised for riding me hard about being from the mainland. And he said he'll deal with the black car. The next day, my cousin's son picked me up from the bus stop near the house on his moped. We noticed the black car following us, but acted like we didn't. We pulled up to the house, and as soon as the black car parked, out came my Samoan-built, muscle-bound cousin with a metal baseball bat, taking practice swings as he approached the car. It reversed halfway down the street, hit a fence, jumped a curb, and turned around in a front yard, and was never seen again. I went to visit my best friend who had moved from Arizona to California. It was fun, until the end, where we got into a fight, resulting in cutting the trip a day short. In the morning, I packed my stuff and took an Uber to the Greyhound and exchanged my ticket for a ride that day. However, the bus didn't leave until 4pm, and it was around 10.30 in the morning. I was so upset about my fight with my friend the night before that this five and a half hour wait was just a little cherry on top of it all. I ended up going to a small grocery store and getting a few apples for the trip and then heading back and waiting at the gate where my bus would arrive. And that is where I met Jeremy. He was sitting on the phone, talking really loud, and I couldn't help but observe him. He was a mid-thirty-year-old bald guy, with a moustache, wearing a wife-beater, dickies, crew socks, and a baby blue bandana, which he kept rearranging, tied to his neck, hanging out of his pocket, simply wrapped around his wrist, etc. I know you're not supposed to judge, but I kind of just knew to keep my distance from this guy just in case. So here I am, 
opening my bag looking for an apple. And he looks over to me and asks if I'm hungry. To which I respond, oh no thanks, I'm actually just looking for my apple. And he says, I have plenty of candy I don't really even want. Here, just take them. He hands me some Snickers and some Laffy Taffy and stuff. I knew right away this was a little weird. So I put them in my backpack for later. And I was just planning on throwing them away when he wasn't looking. 4pm arrives. And so does our bus. We get in. And the bus driver lets us know that we need to stop in another city nearby to switch buses. So we all get off. And I head to the line where the new bus is going to be. And Jeremy flags me down and says, Hey, I saved you a spot. And I say, Oh, it's okay, thanks. And these two old Asian ladies are near him, thanking him for saving them a spot and talking to him like they knew him. And he was just as friendly and kept insisting on me to coming over. I thought, let's not cause a scene. What's the worst that could happen? I go over and thank him, and wait for the bus, and he says, Do you have a dollar on you by any chance? And I say, Oh yeah, here. And he goes and grabs a coke and comes back with it. For you, he said, and handed it to me. I was clearly confused, and he said, You look like you could use it. I was a little put off, but not too badly. Once the bus started loading us in, I sat down and he came right behind me and said, lucky we got our seats next to each other, and took his laptop and earphones out. Oh good, I'll be left alone, I thought. Wrong. Here, grab the other headphones so we can watch a movie together. Obviously, I declined, but he kept insisting, even though the internet wasn't working on the bus. So, he couldn't play a movie anyway, so he resorted to talking. He asked me a lot of questions, about if I had a boyfriend, and I did. And he asked me if we were going to get married. That's where I finally got put off, but also tried to be engaging enough not to piss him off, because they don't check your luggage at the Greyhound. And I didn't want to know what he had trotting around in his bags. That sounded bad, but I just wanted to be safe. Then he starts telling me that he was in California, taking care of his sick dad yada yada, and that he was heading to Texas to see his estranged wife and kids. He told me about how much he misses them, and how he couldn't wait to go home and be part of their lives again. While he's saying this, he's toying with a little piece of paper that he took out of his pocket in his hand, and I glanced over at it without thinking. He lifts up the paper and says, Oh yeah, I met a lady, very nice Filipino, and we had a very good time last night, and she gave me some drinks from her homeland for my trip. Want one? I shook my head, but he gave me one anyway. It was sort of like Humex, a canned fruit drink, and I told him I was okay, but he grabbed himself one and said, cheers, and then he started going on about this lady and asking me for advice. Should I call her? Do you think it will make my wife mad? I stared at the can thinking how I could get out of the bus, and he says, well aren't you going to drink it? And I opened the can and took a few fake sips and said it was really good or something along those lines. And he smiled at me. When he smiled, I was disgustingly uneasy. His teeth were dark and yellow and partially black. Very, very crooked teeth. And a week's worth of plaque. I mean layers of this stuff all over his teeth. I worked in a dental office, mind you. And those teeth were amongst the most disgusting I have ever seen. Not to mention that he reeked 
a filthy combination of vomit and cigarettes. I wanted to throw up and instantly wanted to leave, but it was a packed bus in the middle of the desert and no security. So I thought for now, I won't do anything. Then he started asking me if I go to church and he told me he had a special book for me. He handed me some of children's Jesus sing-along songs book and told me it was very clear to him that he wanted me to keep it. I took it and thanked him. I was being short with him at this point and wanted to avoid his breath, which was absolutely nauseating. Cut to many stops later, around 10 or 11. Everyone starts falling asleep. And so does he, but he falls asleep with his legs wide open and they were rubbing up against my thigh. So I sat with my chin to my knees, sobbing softly so he couldn't hear me. I was so uncomfortable and scared because I didn't know what kind of person he was and couldn't sit anywhere else because the bus was full. The lights were dim on the bus, so nobody saw me. But I wish someone did. I cried for maybe an hour before he woke me up and started trying to rest his head on my shoulders. Then he started mumbling, beautiful, sexy. And I thought I was hearing wrong, but I still texted my boyfriend telling him about the creep and what I thought I heard him say. And my boyfriend told me maybe I was overreacting but I would be soon home nonetheless. While I am texting my boyfriend, I noticed Jeremy glancing over at my phone a lot and I kind of saw what was coming. So I opened up my maps to check to see how long the ride was until I got home and Jeremy mumbles what I knew he would. Who are you texting? Let me see. And I show him my maps app and told him I was just checking to see where we were. So then Jeremy sits up and starts mumbling again, a little clearer. You're so pretty. You're a very pretty girl, you know that. And he touched my thigh. I was shocked to say the least. All I could manage to say was, why are you doing this? And he said, because you're so sexy and you're just so pretty. And he said this while opening his legs more and more. At this point, I didn't even hide it. I just clearly text my boyfriend panicking. And Jeremy says, let me see your phone, little girl. And ignore his demands. And then he lets his head fall on my shoulders. I pushed it off and he kept mumbling like he was falling back asleep. Then later, the bus driver stopped and told us we were at a gas station and if anyone needed anything. Jeremy is now awake and pretending like an hour didn't go by and hands me in a hundred dollar bill and told me to get us some snacks. I told him I was fine and he says, okay, I'll get us some honey buns and drinks and gets out. This was my chance. I grabbed all my stuff and headed to the bus driver and told him what happened. But he said he couldn't do anything because he technically didn't do anything to me. He just freaked me out. The bus driver suggested I sit with someone else in the meantime. I look for the friendliest face I can find. And I see this really nice looking guy. Looks a lot like my favorite uncle. So I took solace in him. I didn't even realize I was crying until I tried explaining the situation to him in as brief as possible. And he understood through the panic and told me to sit near the window and that he would come over for me. I look in the reflection of the bus window to see Jeremy get on and head towards the back. He notices I wasn't there and starts looking around frantically. Melanie? Melanie? And the doors close and the bus driver starts back on the road. The new person I'm sitting next to begins to tell me he thought we were riding together, as did other passengers. They all thought that he was either my uncle 
or just a really creepy looking life partner. I cried so hard when he said that, because I told him I felt helpless and nobody seemed to care. And he just comforted me and told me I would be gone and away from all of this soon enough. And he was right. By the time I got to the station, it was 4.20 and I breathed a sigh of relief. My boyfriend picked me up and I told him what happened and I never saw the guy again. A couple of years ago, I used to attend a boarding school in Singapore. This was for the last two years of high school, or junior college as we call it. I'm a Catholic, and since none of my friends in the boarding school were practicing Catholics, I attended Sunday Mass on my own every week. If you've ever been to Singapore, you know it's one of the best countries to get around on your own. It's sometimes even more fun than going around with other people. So, this wasn't something that bothered me very much. This Sunday in question came before a long week of submissions and tests and I was already stressed to begin with. On top of that, I had also somehow managed to oversleep, as I liked attending the 8am mass. It was the one with the best choir, you see. So, I had to splurge on a cab instead of taking the bus like I usually do. And I've only got a limited amount of money for the month, as it's from my parents, and I spend most of it on food. So by the time I walked to church, I was upset and just looking for some peace. I guess the stress made me look frazzled and upset, which might have been what caught his attention. As I was late for the mass, I had to stand in the back of the church with the other latecomers, as there were no seats left open for us. This man was standing a few feet to my right. He was wearing spectacles and an eternal frown. He was Chinese, like almost everyone else in the church. I noticed him scowling at me throughout the mass, but I ignored him on purpose, because I didn't want to get pissed unnecessarily. I was the only Indian in my boarding school, so I was used to receiving weird, I'm not racist, but comments from my peers and occasionally teachers. It didn't help that the area in which my school and also this church were located was a pretty rich neighborhood and I had never seen an obviously non-Chinese person in the church. So I was being stared at and was the obvious minority. I refused to pay this guy any attention. What happened next took place during a lull in the mass. During the distribution of communion, many people tend to move out of church after receiving communion. So a seat opened up near I was, and the man was standing. I moved towards it, after making sure there were no elderly around me who would like to take the seat, and sat there. The man manoeuvred himself, so that he was now standing behind me. This was when I began feeling unsafe. Then he began talking. His words were not directed towards anyone in particular. He seemed to be there on his own. The silence in the church only served to amplify what he was saying. Only in our section though, as he wasn't speaking that loudly. Basically, this random guy began railing about how the Indians were destroying his beautiful country. He went on about how they were prostituting themselves on the streets in Geylang, stinking up their schools and hospitals, and making Singapore into a jungle. How the government needs to throw them all out. He said a bunch of other things that I don't remember now. And he also repeated himself an awful lot, which is why it got stuck in my head. He must have said prostituting at least five times, 
and maybe even switched it out for whoring once or twice. They do say variety is the spice of life. It was obvious that his words were meant for me. I turned around to look at him when he first began, with a kind of expression that said, Are you kidding me? He was staring at me, his face the stock image for hatred and rage. The people around him were shifting uncomfortably. I turned back around, shut my eyes, and willed him quiet. But he didn't shut up. At some point, I began quietly crying. I wanted so badly to move away, to run out of the church. But I was afraid of causing a scene, and making people notice me in a way that I didn't want to be noticed. I cannot fully explain the absurdity of the situation. We were in a church. In some other section, the priest was still distributing communion to the Congress. The rest of the church sat in prayful silence. And in the back, in this one corner, this random guy was spewing hateful, racist comments directed at a 17-year-old girl, and nobody said a word to shut him up. When the priest returned to the altar, and had us rise for the final blessing, I took the opportunity to get out of my pew and move away from the man. To my horror, he followed. The mass had ended by then, and people were moving towards the exit, as was I. He followed behind me, raised his voice, and asked me where I was going, and called me a prostitute several times. This was when a lady in the vicinity said something like, Don't say that. Don't use those words. But when I looked at her thinking she would help me get away from this guy, she refused to meet my eye, and moved away. We got out of the church, and I couldn't see the guy anymore. So I ran blindly towards the exit, and in the direction of the bus stop. I couldn't think straight, and I didn't know what I looked like. I had no clue what was happening. I got to the bus stop, and decided to get on the first bus that pulled up, even if it was going on the wrong route. I thought I was safe, and got my phone out of my purse. Then I turned around, and just like a horror movie, he was there, walking towards me. The only other people at the bus stop were a woman and a kid. I did not feel confident enough to approach them and ask them for their assistance. With my fingers shaking, I unlocked my phone and called my roommate. She answered the phone groggily. I had probably woken her. And without waiting for her to say anything, I told her very loudly that a strange man had followed me from church to the bus stop, and he had been verbally abusing me, and I did not feel safe. The man who had been advancing towards me all this time went and stood with the woman and child, who had also heard me and moved away from him. A bus pulled up. I got in, the doors closed, and we pulled away. In that moment, I was so overwhelmed by what had happened that I stood at the entrance of the bus, next to the bus driver, and just burst out crying. I don't even remember what was going through my head. My heart was going crazy in my chest, and I must have been having the worst panic attack. The bus driver and everyone else on the bus was staring at me as if I were crazy. And I probably was. At the next stop, the driver asked me if I was okay. And when I couldn't respond, asked me where I needed to go. I gave him the name of my school. And a passenger who had just gotten onto the bus took me back out, explained to me which bus I would need to take, and asked someone who was waiting at the bus stop to make sure I caught the right bus. Somehow, I got back to my boarding school. I had left my roommate on call, and it had made her extremely worried. 
by the time I got back to my room. She had notified our mentor and had placed a call to the church to ask if I was still there and if they could find me. They obviously didn't know anything. So I guess that's my story. I just want to clarify that besides that one experience, I had never felt unsafe in Singapore. And I am not in any way trying to post that Singaporeans are discriminatory towards Indians. This did shake me though, and I could not bring myself to go back to that church for a long time. I truly hope I am never placed in a similar situation again, or anyone else for that matter.